Hello, everyone, and welcome to NetMed Sessions in association with the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, NANETS. I'm Mark Lewis. I'm thrilled to have you joining us today, and I'm also just beyond delighted to be speaking to a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Lauren Fishbein, who is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Colorado in the endocrinology, metabolism, and diabetes section. Dr. Fishbein has an accomplished pedigree. Uh, she did her medical school at University of Florida, her residency at some place called Harvard, never heard of it, and her fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. And Lauren, you and I are colleagues. One of the things I love about um, the NET community is uh, on both the patient and the professional side, I find it to be very tight knit. Um, I think it's a necessarily multidisciplinary space. And as we'll talk about today, I'm a medical oncologist and you're an endocrinologist, but I honestly feel like it's vital that we have synergy between our disciplines, especially around neuroendocrine tumors. So um, as a fellow member um, of the medical community, I'm always curious to ask people, what is your why? Why did you go into medicine and why did you go into endocrinology in particular? Well, first, thanks, Mark, for having me today. Um, I'm excited to be here and share, share some of this information. So how did I get excited about medicine? Well, I was excited about medicine back in the early 90s when I was in college, thinking about personalized medicine. The human genome hadn't been sequenced yet. And I read an article about the fact that they were trying to sequence the human, human genome and how eventually we'd be able to use our genes to assess risk for disease and also use our genetics for treatments. And that honestly is what got me excited about applying to MD PhD programs and becoming a physician scientist. It was that idea of personalized medicine. And what I like about endocrinology and working on neuroendocrine tumors is that I can take my love for genetics and apply that to neuroendocrine tumors because there's such a rich genetic background, um, both on the her hereditary side and on the tumor genetic side. Yeah, I was actually going to talk to you about that, you know, again, showing um, all of my cards, and, and you know this, but just for our audience, I carry a hereditary tumor syndrome myself, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. I can tell you just how pivotal endocrinologists have been in my own care. Um, but also, I think it's crucial to distinguish um, a familial pattern of disease um, from sporadic disease, what we might otherwise call bad luck. And when I was reviewing your CV, I had to smile. One of your articles, I think, is called something like um, pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. Is this a genetic disorder? Uh -huh. So can you tell our audience a little bit, and I realize this is going to have to be a broad answer, but when you're seeing a patient in clinic, as a lot of our patients will ask this, how do you start to discern whether there is that pattern? Obviously, you're going to take a family history versus, again, something that's only going to affect that individual in front of you. Yeah, so this is really important, especially for pheopara, because up to 30 to 40 percent of people who have a pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma will have a hereditary link to it, a genetic uh, change that they were born with that increased their risk for developing that tumor. So actually, although we take a good family history, I don't care whether the family history is positive or negative for pheopara because there's such a high rate of having that hereditary component. And not everybody knows their family history in enough detail to give you information. And not all these tumors are 100% penetrant, meaning you can have that genetic risk and never develop one or all of the tumors of a particular syndrome. So sometimes family history isn't always helpful on the pheopara side. So for pheopara, we recommend everyone get that genetic testing to really find out. But you bring up a good point. There are a lot of other hereditary syndromes that are much more penetrant, meaning there should be a strong family history of at least some of the features of the syndrome. And so really taking a very good, strong family history is important and suspecting things. We talk about this with neuroendocrine tumors all the time, that if you don't think of it in your differential, you won't be able to diagnose it. And the same is true for genetic hereditary conditions that predispose to neuroendocrine tumors. We have to think about the fact that there could be this genetic hereditary component um, and think about whether it's important to do that testing or not. Yeah. And can I just clarify, because you talked about the Human Genome Project, and I have to smile because Again, dating myself slightly, um, I wrote a research paper on that in high school. Uh -huh. And it seems so science fiction to me. And, and looking back, it is absolutely remarkable how quickly technology has advanced. 
you know, I think by uh, Moore's law, they estimate that, you know, our computing power and the number of transistors that you can fit in a microchip basically doubles every year and a half. And, and with that, you know, the Human Genome Project, which as you know, it took, I think, roughly a decade and was a, you know, essentially a global multi-billion dollar effort among all these scientists. Now that they've done that hard work, we can essentially recapitulate that now uh, in a matter of weeks, you know, and, and at a much, much lower cost. It's just absolutely incredible how that's come along. So what I'm getting at is, and I think this is a key distinction for our listeners, um, when you're testing um, for these disorders, you're, you're testing the person usually and not the tumor, is that correct? That is correct. So when we're talking about hereditary conditions, it's important to check the, the person for every cell in their body. So we usually do that with a blood sample or a saliva sample. That's different than checking the tumor for genetic changes. Yes. When the person is born with a genetic change, every cell in their body should have it. The tumor will probably have it also, but tumors can develop changes in some of these same genes we're talking about where that gene change is not present in the whole body, but just the tumor has it. And so it's important to distinguish between those. Does the whole person carry this genetic change or does it occur just in the tumor itself? So when we're talking about hereditary disease, we are talking about the whole person. Yeah, and again, I'm not trying to make this about me, but I will use my, myself as an example. So I have the ME1 syndrome. So to your point, I'm a mutant. All the cells in my body um, are, are mutated in that way. Uh, but 40% of all comers with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors will harbor the MEM1 mutation in their tumor, um, but not necessarily in the person. In fact, the, the very, very small minority uh, of the patients with the MEM1 mutant tumors will actually carry the syndrome themselves. So I think this distinction between germline mutations that affect the whole person and, and also pass on heritable risk is really crucial when we're talking about genetic testing in, in cancer, because I think that gets pretty easily confused. Um, so I'm curious, like what proportion of your practice would you just estimate involves taking care of, of neuroendocrine tumor patients? Um, in my university practice, it's almost everybody. Actually. Wow. wow. Um, I'm pretty sub sub specialized in that particular clinic. So it is people who have pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, people who have genetic predisposition to it. And I also see a lot of patients with multiple endocrine neoplasia type one and other genetic predisposition syndromes and other endocrine uh, cancer syndromes. So, uh, and almost all of those have a net as at least one component of their syndrome. So um, it's pretty, pretty biased towards neuroendocrine tumors. Well, that's wonderful. We, uh, we zebras, thank you. Um, and I have to ask, I'm, I'm not just paying uh, lift service to our audience. I find net patients, one of the true delights of taking care of them is they are very, very savvy. Uh, they tend to be remarkably self-advocating. And so I'm just kind of curious, in, in the flow of patients to your practice, um, do you get self-referrals? What's the typical way that a patient arrives in your clinic? Yeah, there's, there's actually lots of different ways. So I don't know if there's a typical, but there are several that are more common. So some are gonna be self-referrals where they have you know, asked around to patient advocacy groups or others about specialty providers in their area. Um, some of the referrals come through through genetics. So if someone had genetic testing already, they are then sent to me by that genetic counselor to do the screening and surveillance for them. Sure. Um, and then coming from family members. So if I take care of one person in a family, if they have other family members in the area who might also carry that genetic a change that predisposes them. I tend to see a lot of big families as well. That's wonderful. Yeah. And is there any role in, in terms of this you know, kind of referral network? Have you seen any interaction with the internet and social media in particular? Uh, it's a good question. I had a patient the other day, a new patient that I saw who's, who um, was asking me a question. I said, oh, well, we recently published Nanette's guidelines on metastatic pheopera. She said, I know I saw your tweet or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time that a patient has told me they, um, they saw a tweet of mine. So uh, you, you may get more of the Twitter accolades from patients. Um, That's the first time someone has mentioned it to me, at least. Well, that's how you and I have been staying in touch during COVID. The last time I saw you in person, I was thinking it was almost exactly two years ago. There was a patient facing a uh, net conference in Denver. Here in Denver, yep. yeah. Yeah, your neck of the woods. And that's the last time I saw you in person, but we've been staying in touch virtually. I have to tell you, I, I just think the, the dialogue online is so rich. 
And to anyone listening to this that hasn't yet delved into Twitter, you know, what I would say is it is the farthest thing, I think. Um, and yes, I'm biased, but I think it's it's not frivolous. I, I think it's actually become incredibly substantive, you know, provided that you're engaging in, in the right conversations. And what's happened with my practice, Lauren, is the more I talk on, on Twitter about nets, and, and, and frankly, the more I reveal that I am dealing with them myself, the more there's this kind of beautiful feedback loop where more patients with nets come to my practice to the point that now, so I'm a GI oncologist. Of course, I see the more prevalent things like colon cancer and the more typical form of pancreas cancer. But I would estimate at this point, probably about a quarter of my patients are neuroendocrine tumor patients. And, and they're like you, I have to be really careful to separate the, the sporadic cases, the people who just got this as best we know from bad luck, from the hereditary cases. Finding the latter though, for me, and again, this is um, coming from my own experience, my own family, you know, the generations above me, my, my father and my paternal uncle, my grandfather, they didn't know they had a hereditary condition. Ergo, they had absolutely no foresight of what was going to happen to them. And frankly, they went to their graves. And this is really um, sort of touches my heart with a lot of guilt. They thought they had done something wrong and they absolutely didn't. So I really am grateful to you for your, your care of these families. Um, and it really is a, a, is a family affair. And it's a tip of the iceberg too, where if you find one patient that's affected, um, you then do cascade testing and potentially find other people and can help them and perhaps even save them um, from some of the more you know, invasive or involved treatments that their, their affected relatives have had. So just changing briefly to the therapeutic angle in your career, um, you know, what are the advances that have excited you the most? And is there anything coming that you think we should anticipate with, with some delight? Oh, it's a good question. I think um, in in the Pheopara space in particular, because that's that's uh, more my expertise within the net. Um, I think there are several things. So uh, you know, uh, when I was a fellow, we published one of the first papers describing that up to forty percent had a hereditary component, and it really wasn't known before that. Um, other people have been responsible for identifying a lot of those genes that, that are associated. So I think that's a really uh, cool, exciting advance because of what you said. The, I believe knowledge is power. So the more that we know about our hereditary condition, the more we can screen for early detection. Yeah. And for a lot of nets, that's key is early detection and trying to surgically remove and cure things before um, they get too large or have more of a risk of, of metastatic disease. Now, speaking of that, um, I think there are some good advances. So the radionucleotide nucleotide therapies with PRT, with um, MIBG, these are important uh, advances for treatment of metastatic neuroendocrine tumors really across the board. Um, so to me, that's exciting. And I think that in the future, there'll be even more work um, looking at different combinations, different ways of giving that therapy, um, whether it's in combination with oral agents or, or just different treatment regimens. Um, so I think there's a lot on the horizon there. The other thing that I'm excited about and that I tell my patients about is, is that idea of personalized medicine. Yeah. A lot of the treatments we have for NETS seem to work really well for subgroups of people. And so the more we can understand about the tumors, how they develop, what are those genetic changes, we can tailor different treatments to the right person and, and the one whose tumor will respond to that particular treatment. So I'm still hopeful even this many decades later that uh, we'll, we'll just get better and better with our personalized uh, medicine initiatives for treating metastatic disease in particular. Yeah, that's the real promise of precision medicine, isn't it? And I, I think in that's uh, this burgeoning field of theranostics, where we're pairing, you know, this increasingly high resolution imaging um, in a manner that's not just diagnostic, it's not just giving us a picture of the person's body and their tumor distribution, it's actually showing us also sort of the lock and key hypothesis, how we can match that scan into a treatment. I think that's really exciting. Um, you know, it, it did worry me a little bit when we were, you know, doing these you know, more advanced, say, PET scan and, and finding disease but not necessarily having the treatments to match to our, our new discoveries. Essentially, you're telling Excellent. the patient, this is worse than we thought, but then not being able to act on it. So I think that's a really, really important marriage of the diagnostics and the therapeutics. Um, and then I think it's important you know, together and for our audience to just kind of look back and, and marvel a little bit um, at how much progress has been made in a relatively short time span. Now, obviously, not nearly fast enough uh, for some patients who are either 
um, suffering now or who we've lost in the past. But um, I wanted to end our conversation with a, um, a quote uh, that I think will resonate with you and our listeners from a lecture given in 1987. Now, this was by um, Dr. Charles Mortel, who, among others, was sort of the father for um, somatostatin analog therapy back in the 1980s. So he gave my favorite lecture of all time, which is called An Odyssey in the Land of Small Tumors. And again, since then, you just have to think you know, together about all the things that have happened. So you've got our computing power, we're, we're doing you know, genome uh, resulting, you know, not just in, in years, but in weeks and at very, very low cost. And then we're- And even days, results. really. And days, yeah. yeah. And yeah. we're taking those results and we're um, applying them uh, to patients and their families. And we've got these new diagnostic and therapeutic techniques. Back then, this all this man had really was, um, you know, spastic and analog. But this is what he said, and I think this is evergreen. So he said, the neuroendocrine tumors present one of the most fascinating challenges encountered in practice. They have a natural history of disease like no other. Patients present in an almost surrealistic manner, a mix of tumor-related symptoms and signs with bizarre and sometimes grotesque endocrine syndromes. Certainly, they are rarely encountered, but as specialists, it is our responsibility to understand the less common diseases. The privilege of caring for a patient with a neuroendocrine tumor is one to be savored. And, you know, I love that. I think that that stands true today, of course, and I think it's only possible, really, these days through multidisciplinary efforts. So I really... Thank you, Lauren, for obviously taking the time to talk to me, but more importantly, the work that you do. Um, I know as a patient, like I said, I cannot, um, I cannot manage my, myself. Um, I need help in part of my multidisciplinary team as an endocrinologist. And then in my clinical practice um, with my net patients and some of these hormone syndromes and, and the sort of wild um, swings and catecholamines that you see with, with Pheopara, I really have um, benefited. My patients have benefited from help from doctors like you. So thank you so much. Um, I think net care is a team sport, and I think you Absolutely. represent um, endocrinology admirably. So thank you so much for the conversation today. I think our audience will really benefit from listening to you. Uh, did you want to plug your Twitter handle by any chance? <laughs> sure. It's at LMF Endo. And um, I just wanted to add one more thing, which is that people who have neuroendocrine tumors have that extra challenge of having tumors and cancers and potentially having that hormonal aspect. Yes. And that makes them different than a lot of other tumors and cancers. And so it is really important to have that multidisciplinary team so that these tumors and uh, can be attacked, if you will, from multiple angles and the patients can be cared for uh, appropriately through all the challenges that, that they face with these tumors and this disease. It also makes the word carcinoid such a... Um vexing misnomer when you know, it gets translated as cancer-like and these people are told, oh, you know, you have the, the good type of tumor, when in fact, as you're well aware, you know, the hormonal excess of this can certainly be a detriment to, to quality of life. And with some of the hormones that you have to manage can actually be a very acute threat to longevity as well. So, yep. well, yep. well, thank you so much for talking today and bringing to light the important endocrine and familial aspects of NETS. Uh, and I hope that our audience listening has appreciated this. And thanks again for joining us today for this NANET session. Thanks you so much.